Good day and welcome to yet another one of our weekly wraps from Rand Swiss. Uh, as usual, we'll do a brief overview of what happened this week as well as a deep dive into a story I think that might be interesting to uh, viewers. Okay, uh, this week has been an interesting week. We've had a nice little rally at the start of the week, uh, you know, based on a couple of things that we'll talk about and that'll be our deep dive coming through this week. Uh, other stories we'll talk about is what's happening right now in uh, Russia, Ukraine, and as well as a little brief overview of the oil market and uh, what's happening with oil prices at the moment. So let's start off with the Russia-Ukraine situation. It does seem to be that the Ukrainians are really, really pushing ahead quite fast. Uh, in fact, pushing ahead so fast uh, that uh, there's some fears that the Russians may decide to have to use a tactical nuclear weapon uh, in order to stop them, because that is something that uh, there's one of the few things they basically have left to do. Uh, we've seen uh, massive push-throughs in every single Russian line. Uh, we're talking about uh, captures of soldiers, captures of weaponry, and remember the Russians and the Ukrainians basically use the same kind of machinery. So for whatever they capture from the Russians, Ukrainians can pretty much put their people into it and suddenly it's their, their weaponry. Uh, there's huge, uh, you know, uh, amounts of Russian soldiers trapped uh, in different areas. Apparently in the south there's about 225,000 soldiers trapped and lots of machinery. And apparently these are the best soldiers Russia has available. Uh, so it remains to be seen what they can do about this. Apparently there's been uh, talk about the Russians are moving some of their nuclear uh, armaments and that is obviously very, very troubling. Now, at the moment, I obviously don't think that there's going to be a nuclear war. If I did, I'd be somewhere in a bunker, somewhere in the Karoo, uh, you know, trying to basically teach my kid how to shoot a gun or something, you know. So I don't think that's that's on the cards at the moment. But even like a 1% or 2% chance of something like that happening is very dangerous because it's, it's, it's very easy to see how a tactical nuclear weapon goes to a strategic nuclear, you know, move. A tactical nuclear weapon is like a battlefield weapon, you know what I mean? Strategic is where you try and wipe out the entire other country. And uh, there's many scenarios in which a single, you know, tactical escalates to uh, the use of strategic within a few days. So that's obviously very troublesome. So that is Russia, Ukraine at the moment. Uh, still no uh, clarification on what happened to the Nord Stream pipeline. Uh, the Americans uh, say the Russians, the Russians are saying the Americans. Uh, from what I gather, most people are now saying probably the Americans did it. There's evidence that uh, American helicopters were around the area. There's plenty of evidence that, uh, you know, just from the statements made by the Americans after the event, uh, where they said this was an opportunity, uh, I think uh, Secretary Blinken said that, uh, an opportunity to basically, uh, you know, really improve the situation. Uh, you wouldn't say that after a terrorist attack by your enemy, say that this was an opportunity. Okay, that's a very strange term to use. And of course there was, <laughs> Also, that weird tweet from a Polish um, politician saying, thank you, America. Uh, so uh, I think it's pretty clear that the Americans likely did it, but there's no actual official confirmation. The next story is what's happening in the oil market at the moment. Uh, oil prices right now are rising you know, quite significantly. This is after OPEC cut uh, demand, OPEC plus, let me say, no longer OPEC, OPEC plus, which includes the Russians, have cut uh, supply quite dramatically by about 2 million barrels a day. And uh, this pretty much gets in line with what it, most members are comfortable with exporting. You know, uh, the other quotas they had out there, most members could not actually reach the full quota because they just have the capacity to do so. Uh, cutting back uh, all uh, you know, production by 2 million barrels a day is obviously uh, going to increase prices we saw prices rise quite sharply from that point of view uh, you know and also we are getting to a point really recently or really soon rather where we're going to see the SPR the strategic petroleum reserves draw that's happening in the US uh, having to slow down or even reverse uh, the reason being is that they've already basically got to levels that they haven't had for multiple decades they've been drawing out quite a lot of, a lot of oil uh, this really is not meant to be the situation in which they are drawing oil for they should be drawing oil out for a war situation where they have no access to you know sources or for uh, maybe a natural disaster that affected their production for instance in the Gulf of Mexico which they had recently uh, but rather, uh, this is being used just to manipulate the oil market and uh, bring the prices down. Uh, like I said a, a while back, strategically, uh, this is foolish, but it seems to be politically you know, viable because this is just ahead of the U.S. elections coming up. And there's a really, really strong correlation between support for Biden and the Democrats and a lower oil price, a lower, a lower petroleum or gas price, basically, in the, in the U.S. Gas prices rise support drops very sharply so that's something to be considered going forward from here it's that we probably are going to see even if we do see a, a drop in prices right now because of maybe more pumping from the SPR or, or so on after the election we are almost certainly going to see uh, more prices rising because you know the US is just not going to be able to pump what it's pumping out from its reserves uh, and in fact it's going to have to reverse it's going to be from going from a positive to a negative we could be talking about as many as five plus million barrels a week uh, you know string from basically production to uh, consumption okay and now comes to my deep dive what's exactly happening in the market at the moment well 
last week we had the situation where uh, the Bank of England came out and they discussed, or sorry, they announced that they were going to start buying bonds. The market took that very positively and that gave us a really big boost, uh, you know, for a couple of days. And the reason for that was the belief was that there's going to be a pivot in the Fed. The Fed's going to pivot because, uh, you know, the UK is blinked, the Fed's going to blink, you know, central banks are cowards, they're not going to be able to start at market pressure. This week, we also saw the Australians come out and raise rates by less than expected. Now, what's really uh, important to consider here is that we are seeing, like from Morgan Stanley and so on, uh, a real consideration that the Fed is going to pivot quite soon. And not because just of the, the, the problems with the actual economy, things like, you know, unemployment, things like a recession. Uh, because that is one concern but also because just like the uk had a situation where they had to basically go to buy bonds because of underlying disturbances in the financial system why am i saying that because right now we all know the us dollar is incredibly strong you know it's at unbelievably high levels versus the pound versus the euro yes there's been a bit of you know, weakening in the dollar recently versus the pound and so on but it's not you know significant when you consider the longer term view compared to where we were a decade or so ago the pound is way way stronger than the than the dollar uh, that it was and same thing for the euro same thing for most currencies look at our currency you know 18 17 50 is like the range at the moment and what that means is that there's major disturbances happening in the global financial system because with a dollar this strong, it's actually causing a bit of a dollar crunch. And that's causing, you know, disturbances globally. Now, eventually those disturbances are going to come back and hurt the U.S. as well. It's going to affect the U.S.'s basically stating of the reserve currency of the world. It causes a lot of trouble for the U.S. And that may be the thing that causes the U.S. to actually go and start to pivot. Not just the fact that unemployment and the recession is happening, but because basically the rest of the world can't afford a U.S. dollar as strong as it is. If the rest of the world was raising rates at the same rate as the U.S., maybe we could say that was going to happen. But the rest of the world is not. Very few places in the world are raising rates as fast as the US. The US is the safest economy in the world, it's the largest economy in the world, and it has the, the best returns for your, your, your currency, your deposits, of any developed market in the world at the moment. The Japanese aren't doing anything, the Europeans aren't doing much more, the British try to do something, but now the reversing part of it, the Australians aren't really falling through. We are not seeing the rest of the world kind of following the US's lead as strongly as we would have thought. That makes the dollar get stronger. The only reason the dollar gets weaker over time is if there's like stability in the world or there's massive, massive more yield elsewhere. Right now, there is instability in the world and the yield in the dollar is higher. That means dollar strength. Dollar strength is technically good because it brings things down like inflation and so on, but it causes massive disturbances. Any country that's borrowed in dollars, problems. Any commodity that's denominated in dollars, problems, because it's basically pumping inflation around the world. It causes a lot of disturbances in the world, and those disturbances will feed back to the U.S. and cause problems in the U.S., which may be a reason we are seeing some positivity coming through. Now, what is that going to mean for you? Well, a pivot is going to be positive for the market, that's quite frankly true. Uh, strange enough, in that Morgan Stanley report that I mentioned, uh, they said a pivot would be positive in the short term, but really longer term, they have some other issues regarding, for instance, uh, an earnings recession, because they do think that, you know, the stronger dollar is going to affect things, uh, drop in US demand, blah, 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 it's going to affect things to a large extent in the medium term, then A, um, proven by the Fed. But that being said, that is what the market's seeing right now. The market is seeing, to, uh, seeing a possibility of a reason or another reason that the Fed might decide not to raise rates as much as possible, or as much as they've been talking about. Another thing that's been interesting for me is that I found out recently that we're going to be hitting a, a, from, a, from a headwind, from something that's been pushing, sorry, a tailwind, that has been pushing inflation high, that's going to change into a headwind. That's around the U.S. medical inflation number. The U.S. medical inflation number is really, really laggy. It's, it, it, it's, it lags by about a year or so between the actual number in the economy and what is shown up in CPI. The reason for this is that the way the U.S. basically tries to feed through inflation, and like trying, they don't try and go and try and find out what exactly the cost of a surgery is or cost of a, you know, a particular procedure is or the cost of a drug is, they look at it in a slightly different way. The way they figure out what the inflation rate in, in the health services are is they go and look at basically how much money is being spent by the health companies, the insurance companies, versus how much premiums they bring in. They don't just look at the amount it's spent because obviously the bigger premiums come in, the more it's going to be spent. But they look at the amount being spent versus the amount of premiums coming in, and that gives them the idea as to how much inflation there is. Now, we've had a very, very tricky market recently. We've had, in the health sector, think about it, we've had 
for instance, COVID come through and a lot of elective surgeries were basically canceled, meaning a huge build up in terms of uh, that those kind of uh, uh, reserves coming through for these uh, health companies, you know, that really skews some of the numbers. So what we're going to see right now is going to see a switch around from where health, um, you know, the health sector was adding about it was like, you know, about one and a half percent to uh, US GDP to it taking out about a half percent from US GDP. We are talking about more than a percent swing Oh, sorry, sorry, GDP, CPI, US inflation. So we're seeing a situation where inflation, which is adding like about half plus, more than half percent, is going to now be taking out a half percent from inflation because the CPI number is going to be reflecting these old, uh, you know, uh, data around uh, health services. And this is going to be coming fed through over a period of a year. So for the next year or so, we're going to see US inflation, everything else equal, all prices, everything else doing the same, just because of the health sector being 1% lower, more than 1% lower than it was last year. So that's obviously going to be quite good for the Fed because it's making their job easier. Like I said, everything else equal, that alone. Not even looking at the fact that we are seeing, for instance, uh, inventories building up uh, in the US and that's obviously going to cause uh, prices to fall. Not the fact we're seeing, for instance, uh, a real drop down, for instance, in things like you know, container prices. Uh, even like you know, US uh, petrol prices are you know, significantly lower than they were at the peak. All these factors are going to make it easier for the Fed to say, maybe we can basically pull back a little bit. However, I think this is a short term or medium term kind of misstep. Why? The US wants to get back to 2%. I see very little evidence that 2% is achievable in the next couple of years, unless the Fed is really, really aggressive when it comes to interest rates. What I foresee, and this is, remains my uh, forecast, the Fed is going to pivot. It's going to pivot when it sees enough pain in the market, both in the economy and in the financial sector. That pivot is going to come in the form of reducing or halting rate hikes, maybe even reversing to a certain extent, maybe even like the Bank of England doing some QE to make sure that the markets function a bit better, right? This is going to happen when inflation is down from the peak. It's going to be down from 9% to maybe 5% or 6% or something like that, They're even 4%. But even 4%, which is significantly lower than we are right now, is still double the target rate. It's not going to stop when the Fed is basically getting to about 2% for the inflation rate. It's going to stop when the Fed's getting to 5%, 4%, even 6%, depending on what the, the pressures are like in the market. And that is going to be the next step. Okay. And finally, before I leave you, an important factor to, to look at as well. I don't know if you guys know this, but for almost every single rate hike cycle, we always see a fall come through with uh, markets. But that fall peaks in the first third of that cycle. There's been a couple exceptions, but the majority of the time, whenever you have an interest rate cycle where the market uh, expects the Fed to start hiking rates and they have an idea as to how high it's going to go, they adjust much quicker than the Fed basically drops or cuts or sorry, increases rates. They probably they price in that full rate hike within the first third of that cycle. And we are approaching that third of that cycle in the next few months. Okay, so it might be an opportunity for you to guys looking at maybe getting some uh, buys in if you think that the market is a good value. Okay, that's it for this week. Uh, thanks for joining me and I uh, look forward to speaking to you guys again next week. Cheers.